Thank you, Brother Haggett. Appreciate that. Appreciate the singing this morning and this afternoon. I think I forgot to say something this morning, but I appreciate the specials and the work that goes into those, and thank you for that and uh, everything. I hope everybody got a nap this afternoon and uh, came back rested and ready to go, and if you didn't, then uh, I don't know. You can sleep. I'll just tell you like my teacher did in college. Go ahead. You can sit in the back and go to sleep, you know, if you need to, and that'll be good. If you got your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter number 6. Genesis chapter number 6, and... Uh, <clears throat> just want to give you a thought this evening, and probably not one that you haven't heard before, uh, but something that I believe will be helpful. I know that it's helped me, and so uh, I try not to preach anything uh, that hasn't uh, struck me or hasn't uh, uh, helped me in my spiritual walk, and I don't go through the Bible just looking for another message, and so uh, I really do. I try to preach what uh, God has spoken to me about, and then I just convey that message to someone else, and and uh, try to be that way. And so uh, here in Genesis chapter number 6, we'll start at verse number 1. <clears throat> the Bible says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw daughters of men, and they were fair, and they took them as wives, and all, they which, cho uh, all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit will, shall not always strive with men, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years, and there were giants in the earth and in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they were bare children to them, and the same became mighty men, which were of old, and men of renown. In verse number five, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Sound familiar? That's really where we're living right now. And God saw that, and the Bible says that the eyes of the Lord in every place beholding the evil and the good. And so God sees what is going on. God sees the wickedness of man, and it was great in the earth. And verse there at the end of verse 5, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. Man, what a statement. We've only made it five chapters in to the Bible, and now chapter 6, it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. Boy, you talk about give somebody a chance to mess something up, and we can sure do it, can't we? Yeah. God made this world, and it was perfect, and everything that he put in it was right, and he put man in there, and now here we are five chapters later, and, and we're struggling so bad that God says, I'm sorry that I even made man. And here's the sad part about it is, is that God made man in whose image? In his. He made man, and the Bible says that it pleased him. And so God made man in his own image, and it pleased him, and it made him happy. And then this one thing that he made that made him happy and, and pleased him has now gone so far into wickedness and sin that God says, I'm sorry I did it in the first place. It's pretty bad. The Bible goes on and it says in verse number 6, He repented the Lord that he made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. Did you know that sin in his people and sin on this land, it breaks God's heart? I realize that God is, is a God of mercy and all that kind of stuff and we talk about that, but honestly, God says right here and teaches right here in his word that he also gets grieved. Makes him sad. Breaks his heart. When you have a child who does something who is, uh, and, and you've taught them all their life to live a certain way, and then I've seen it, I've, I've talked to parents, and I've seen the, the tears flow down their face as they've said, I've taught this kid uh, my entire life, and their entire life I've done nothing but pour into them, and now they're going and doing their own thing, and I've seen the tears flow down their face of the broken heartedness. It grieves the heart of a parent. Whenever a child goes that direction and does those things against what they have been taught, and God is the same way as our Heavenly Father, He says, it makes me sad. Right. It makes me sad. It grieves my heart. And then it goes into this story, verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man, whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, and it repenteth me that I have made them. Verse 8, I love this. But Noah found grace 
in the eyes of the Lord. So here's what's going on. We're going to get into the story in just a few minutes or into the, into the, uh, to the meat of this message, but here's what's going on, okay? So the Bible says that the sons of God came down and, and, and married basically with the, with the, the uh, uh, ladies of men or the, the daughters of men here, and the Bible says that there were children that were born. Listen, there's all kinds of, of uh, ideas and all this kind of stuff, but here's what I really believe what the Bible says. I like to take the Bible for what it says. You have the sons of God over here. Do you know I am a son of God? Because I am joint heir, I'm bought by, by the blood of Jesus Christ. So you have the, the children of God over here, and they're marrying the children or the daughters of man. So there is a group of people here that is out in the world. They are of the world, and now the, the children of God are, are putting together a union or they're putting together a marriage there, and they're, they're having children, and, and those children are running wild, and they're marrying, and, and they're living in sin and, and all this kind of stuff. And really, the breakdown and the problem was is that the sons of God should have never been over here with anybody in the world to start with. That's the truth of the matter. So you can keep all your opinions and all that kind of stuff to yourself, but I believe what the Bible is teaching us very clearly here is that God's people need to marry God's people. Amen. And we need to raise our children in a godly fashion in the way that would please God. And, and, and that's how we ought to live. And, 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 but you look at the United States of America, that's exactly where we are right now. Is God's people have just gone with the world, and now it's the children that are paying the price. It's the truth. And now those children have been raised and now they've had their own children. And now those children are being raised and, and many of them are getting of voting age and of decision making age. And we're sitting around scratching our heads and saying, boy, we're in a big mess. And really God said a hundred years ago is when you started the mess. Yeah. Two, three generations ago is when the mess started. Now you're paying for it. People, preachers will get up and preach and they'll say, the judgment of God is coming upon America. Well, it's already here, folks. It's already here. Say, how, prove it. Well, you can go to Texas right now and find a daddy and a mama who are fighting over a child that doesn't want to be, what is it, doesn't want to be a girl anymore or, or doesn't want to be a boy anymore. I mean, Really? 25 years ago, if you'd have told me that, I'd have said, no way. You're crazy. Why would somebody do that? Well, because the sons of God got with the daughters of men and they put together a family. What, what are you trying to say, preacher? What I'm trying to say is, is that God has called us out of this world to be separate, to be godly, and to be holy. God has a purpose for our lives, and we really don't need to mingle with the things of the world. We just need to stay away from it. So here we see all of this wickedness that is abounding. Now let me say this before I get too negative in my preaching and uh, everything because I'm normally a pretty positive guy. Let me just say this. That yes, sin is abounding in this earth. I would say that for sure. But I'm thankful that God also said in his word where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. And so I'm thankful today that we have the grace of God that we talked about this morning that is far greater than any sin that ever could abound in my life. Now he goes on in that word grace. Remember the word grace. He says Noah found grace. Amen. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. So in all that wickedness, God is teaching us that we are able to stand. Hey, we're able to live a godly life. We're able to find grace in the eyes of God. And right here he says, and Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Verse 9, and there, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations or upright. And Noah walked with God. Well, that's a big, big statement right there. Right. Noah walked with God. I didn't say that. I didn't. Um, God did. That's a big statement. 
when God says of a man that Noah or whoever walked with God, that carries, carries a lot of weight. Carries a lot of weight. Say, Brother Luke, are you going to preach on walking with God tonight? Well, I'm not 100% sure what I'm going to preach all the way through tonight. Uh, this is just kind of just some thoughts I jotted down right before I came over to church. So you're getting it when I'm getting it. But uh, the bottom line is this, is that yes, when God says of a man, he walked. Buddy, you talk about a relationship with God. It was real. It was genuine. It says he walked with God, and Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and the earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all the flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, and room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without, and with pitch, and this is the fashion which thou shalt make it. Here, it's wicked. It's wicked. You talk about, the Bible talks about violence, it mentions violence over and over, and Talks about the wickedness of men and talks about how they, they had strayed and they had corrupted the land. And, and honestly, I, I hate to admit this, but the Bible even talks about how that every imagination and thought it was wicked, it was evil continually. Not just part of the time, but all the time. And I think about in our world today about how much is even on your phones that you have and, and on the internet and all the wickedness and the evil imaginations that are out there. And, and, and you would be shocked or maybe you wouldn't be. I don't, I don't know, but I know this. Sometimes I get blown away uh, whenever I'm dealing with certain situations with people and I just think I did not even know that that existed. I wished I didn't know that it existed. You talk about wickedness in this world. So here's what happened. One day, Noah... Is walking with God. Because God said that Noah walked with God. And so one day Noah is walking with God. And God says to Noah. He says hey uh, Noah. Things are wicked down there. Yes God I know what it is. Noah I'm tired of it. And, and I'm done with, with all the wickedness that is there. And it's repented me. I, I'm sorry that I've made man. And, and so I'm done with all this. So I'm going to destroy every living thing. I'm going to destroy it all. It's going to be done. I, I'm, I'm sad that I did it and now I'm done with the wickedness and it's over and, and it's done. Okay God? Can you imagine what Noah felt like when he heard these words from God? He says, but Noah you're going to save mankind. Noah I want you to build an ark. Noah, I'm going to tell you how to do it. Noah, you've got 120 years. And I'm going to flood everything. It's going to rain. Imagine Noah's face. Had never seen rain. Rain. What is that? Noah, I'm going to send rain and it's going to flood the earth. It's going to cover everything. There's not going to be anything that will be left. I bet you when Noah set out to walk with God that day, he probably came back with a lot more than what he thought. Yeah. Right. So God explains to Noah exactly what needed to be done. He says, I want you to build an ark. And man, it's going to be a football field and a half long. And it's going to be huge and you're going to put rooms in it and there's going to be all these rooms for all the animals that you're going to, going to put inside and you're going to put the food inside of there and God told Noah exactly what to do and here's what I love about Noah he did it you know you'd have revival in your life if you just did what God told you to do 
If I just did what God told me to do, if I just, if, if God just would speak and I'd just be like, okay, Lord, and I just did like Noah, I just got busy. But so many times we try to bargain with God and we try to say, are you sure? Is it really going to be 120 years or is it going to be 140 years? Uh, or do I need to hurry about this? I love it that Noah just got busy. Amen. Some of us, hey, God is speaking to us and the problem is, is we're not putting feet to our faith. We're just not getting busy. God says, yeah, let's, let's build this ark. Okay. My family's going to think I'm crazy. <laughs> I mean, really, let's just be real here. If I came back to my wife today and told her, babe, we're going to build a boat, she would look at me and she'd say, you're crazy. But if I came back to my wife and said, I'm going to build a boat that's 450 feet long, <laughs> she'd be like, you're nuts. You need to go lay down for a while because you have lost your mind. So here comes Noah. Been walking with God. Opens up the door of the house. Walks inside. Looks at his wife. Maybe he gave her a kiss on the cheek. Maybe tried to butter her up just a little bit. Brought her some flowers. Handed them to her. All right, Noah, what do you want? God told me something this morning. Oh, okay, you've been out walking with God. Yeah. God wants me to build a boat. Noah, why would God want you to build a boat when there's no water here? No, honey, you don't understand. God wants me to build a big boat. No, you didn't answer my first question, and that was why would God want you to build a boat when there ain't no water here? Honey, no, God wants me to build a boat that's 450 feet long. All right, no, you never answered my first question. Why would you want, God wants you to build a boat when there ain't no water here? God's going to flood the earth. It's going to kill everybody. God came to me and told me to build a boat. He told me to save my family. I think Noah maybe just looked at his wife and said, uh, you know I walk with God, right? Yeah, no, I know you walk with God. You know I love God, right? More than anything in this world. Then you're going to have to trust me. Because that's what God told me to do. That's fine, Noah. But you're going to have a hard time telling Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Because you know they're going to get made fun of at school. You know they're going to get ridiculed. If we start trying to build a boat when there ain't no water anywhere around that's bigger than any pond that we could ever find anywhere. Man, I can imagine that he walked in and set them all down. He's looking at them there and he's saying, hey, guys, God told me to build a boat. An ark. Can you imagine? I get enough crazy looks from my kids all the time just over stuff that is common sense stuff. How would that conversation go? And as they converse back and forth and he's trying to explain to them, it came down, I bet, to this. Hey, guys, you know I walk with God, right? Yeah, Dad. You know, I love God, right? More than anything on this earth. You're just going to have to trust me. So here goes Noah. He's talked to his family now, and he's starting the process, and, and he walks down uh, to town, and he goes to the lumber yard, and he says, Hey, fellas, I'm going to need a lot of lumber. Uh, I'm going to need a whole lot of gopher wood. Can you imagine the look on their faces? No, what do you need some gopher wood for? Well, fellas, I, I'm going to be building an ark. It's a big boat. Massive. It's going to have rooms in it. And, man, uh, it's going to float on water. And I'm going to pitch it on the inside. I'm going to pitch it on the outside. And, and I'm going to put this thing together. And it's going to be huge. And, and I'm going to build this thing. Noah, go home. 
I think you had a heat stroke or something, man. You've lost your mind. No, guys, you don't understand. Yes, we do, Noah. Trust me, we understand. No, I need a bunch of gopher wood. I know I'm kind of putting it in today's terminology. But here's what the Bible says happened. That Here he is. He's erecting this boat. He's putting this together. And, man, he had to clear off a big old space of ground just to find a place to put it there. And as he's laying the cross timbers and the beams into place and, and he's putting it all together there, uh, the men would come out and the people would come out and they would, they would say, Noah, <coughs> have you lost your mind? You are such a fool. What are you doing? All this money, all this time. Hey, and year after year, they made fun of him. They called him a fool. They ridiculed him. They laughed at him. They said, it's supposed to rain? Really? You think it's going to rain here? It's never rained before. What are you talking about, Noah? Boy, they, they just ripped him up one side and down the other. Imagine how his boys felt as they go to town to get supplies and come back and forth. All of their peers and their friends. Your dad's crazy. He's lost his mind. What is he doing? 120 years. That's a long time. Yet some of us, if that happened to us for three days, we'd be like, you know what, that's it. 120 years. 120 years later, they've been making fun of Noah, his family. Can you imagine them boys trying to explain to their wives? Look, now I'm bringing you home to meet Dad. And let me just warn you up front. He's a little crazy, you know. <laughs> how, I mean, how does that conversation go? So here they are, they're, them and their wives. 120 years fast forwarded. The boat is built. Man, what? I have not been to the replica. I'd love to go. Uh, some of you may have been. But man, what a boat. What an ark. I mean, absolutely amazing. The structure was fabulous. It's all there. There's a man standing on his front porch one morning. He's just drinking his coffee. You know? All of a sudden he looks down the street. Here comes two rhinos. Walking down the street. I must be seeing things. There's, There's not rhinos around here. So he's sitting there and he's sipping his coffee a little longer and all of a sudden he turns around and looks the other way coming from the other direction. Here's two polar bears walking down the other street going towards the ark. Honey, what would you put in this coffee this morning? I'm telling you, I'm seeing stuff. I don't know. Uh, Man, and all of a sudden, 120 years later, here they come. Hey, two by two, they're walking down the streets and they're all emerging down on top of this ark and then they all they go inside by the hand of God they are led there and so they get inside and all the food is inside and and everything is prepared and now all the animals are in there and and then the the last ones they they walk inside can you imagine the feeling on their inside of them as they see all of this directed by God that is walking inside of the ark and and now they walk inside the door and they're just standing there and I imagine they would just be looking and, and thinking what in the world do we do this door is too big to close And then all of a sudden, hand of God, boom, the door's shut. And here's what I think. At that point in time, at that point in time, everybody had to be a little bit nervous. But God said, it's not going to rain for seven days. So here they are sitting in the boat, sitting in the ark. All the animals. The door's been shut. One day goes by. Two days go by. Three days go by. Noah's wife maybe looks at him. Are you sure? Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Four days go by. Five days go by. Six days go by. Are you sure? I'm sure. Uh, Seven days go by. 
And now at this time, everybody's standing outside of it. They're laughing again. They're mocking again. And then all of a sudden, something falls from the sky. Boy, didn't that change everything? The first drop of rain they felt. Could you imagine the fear that was struck into their life? And could you imagine the relief of those who were inside the ark? Can you imagine? Those first drops of rain. And man, it began to rain and it was just pouring and pouring and pouring. And, and they were on the tops of their homes. They were climbing the mountains. They were getting as high as they possibly could. And all the way until the last breath, hey, they were doing everything that they could. And all of a sudden, now they knew that Noah was right. And for 120 years, they'd heard him preach. For 120 years, they'd seen him build this boat. For 120 years, they made fun of him. And now, they know they're gone. We know that that is true. That Noah's family was so relieved when they felt the first raindrop. We know that that is true, that the world was struck with fear when they first felt the raindrops. But yet, why do we live like the world? We know what the end is. God said, hey, that, that if you'll walk with me, then, then that there's going to be those that are going to be destroyed, but, but I'm going to give you grace and I'm going to take care of you because you're my child. And, and, and so you think about Noah here. Noah, hey, he just walked with God because he knew what the end was going to be. If for no other reason, Hey, and by the way, God is the altogether lovely. It's real easy to get to know him, and it's real easy to get to love him. But if for no other reason, we ought to walk with God because we know what the end is going to be like. We know how this ends, according to the word of God. It's not going to be a flood, but it will be a fire that will come. Hey, and it will last for all of eternity. Hey, I know, I know this. And the bottom line is you say, Brother Luke, I'm saved. That's real good. But the bottom line is if you don't walk with God, it might be your child that ends in the everlasting fire. He walked with God because he cared about his family. I bet you every day Noah probably got up and looked in the mirror if he had one and he said, this whole world's going to die, but I'm going to save my family. Every living and breathing thing is going to die, but not my kids, not my family, not my wife. They're not going to die. Hey, I'm going to save them. Can I ask you something? What does it really do any good if you save the whole world and lose your family? In my opinion, you've lost it all. Say, Brother Luke, are you going to preach on child rearing? I'm absolutely not because I don't know anything about it. I just got five kids and I'm just doing my best to get by right now. But I know this, I love them more than I love any of you. No, no, no offense. I care about my kids and my wife more than anybody else's kids or anybody else's wife. Hey, I love you and I want to help you and that's the reason I'm here. But the bottom line is this, is that I'm not going to lose my family for any of you. Yeah. For anybody's opinion. Hey, by anybody's advice, I'm not going to throw it away. You say, what do you mean? Do you know how much they got made fun of because their dad walked with God? No, it's crazy. Your dad's lost it. He's gone crazy. What, what is he doing building this boat? Well, that's what God told him to do. God's told him to do. You don't really buy that, do you? Your kids are hearing the same thing. It's true. Your kids might be thinking the same thing. See, the difference between Noah and us is this, is that God said, Noah walked with God. It was true. Many times what we say is, oh, I walk with God. And our children in the back of their minds are thinking, really? Really? 
So it doesn't show in the way you act. You see, we live in a world of wickedness. The Bible says to come out from among them and be a separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Hey, and it says, and I will receive you. And, and, and that's what the Bible teaches us, and that we're supposed to be away from the world, and we're not supposed to be a part of the world. And you say, hey, why am I different than everybody else? Well, I'll tell you this. You can't make a difference until you're different. You're never going to make a difference in this world being just like them. That's the problem with so many churches today is that they have liked the power of God for so long that they've traded in the power of God for music and for drum sets on the platforms and for all these different things. Hey, listen, I'm not against those people. I'm not angry at those people. But I will tell you what it is is they went so long without the power of God, they saw that they were losing the next generation, so they became like the world so they could keep some young people in. But I'll tell you that that is a stench in the nostrils of God. God hates that. It's a replica, and it's not changing anybody's life lives somewhere along the road somebody quit walking with God and wondered why it didn't work anymore it works if we work it works if we work no I said I'm gonna save my family whatever it takes Whatever ridicule I have to take. I want to make a difference in my family. And therefore, we're going to be different. And listen, moms and dads, and I know this is kind of a mom and dad type message today, but one of these days, young people, you'll be a mom and a dad too, and you'll be thankful you heard it. One of these days, listen to me. How dare we ask our kids to dress a certain way and live a certain way, and not listen to certain things, how dare we ask them to be different? We don't even walk with God. That's kind of unfair, don't you think? I think so. And here it is. We talked this morning about God says, I will work. We said if we step out of the open, that's where God likes to work. And some of us need to step out of the open as dads and moms. Can I just ask you, I mean, you don't have to answer this question. You answer it in your heart and mind. But like, do you read the Bible with your family? You have family devotions? What kind of music do we listen to? Not just when our kids are around, but when we not when they're not around. Uh, are we real? No, it was real. And God gave him grace to stand in a wicked day. And God gave him grace to raise a godly family in a wicked day. He saved his family. All because he walked with God. Simple. He walked with God. He wanted righteousness. He's upright, the Bible says. He's a righteous man. He, he was perfect. That's what the Bible says about him. The Bible talks about, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Did you know that that kind of life does not fit in anywhere in society? Today, I will say this. We are, in society, we are the weird ones. And yet, 50 years ago, if somebody would have stuck their face in a tackle box and then lifted it out and walked around, they would have been the weird ones. But that's normal now. And if you say something about it, they tell you to be tolerant. Leave people alone. Let them live the way they want to live. Am I right? It's the truth. That's, that's the truth. And they have so beat the church down and the Christian down, the world has. 
that many times we fall right into it and we don't even realize it. And in the night, I just want to be like Noah who just wanted to be righteous. I want to be godly. I haven't made it yet. I'll never really make it till I get to heaven. But I'm going to keep striving for that mark of being a godly man. Hey, I want to keep striving for the mark of just walking with God so much so that, that, that whenever they look at me, they say, hey, that's a man who walks with God. Hey, he may be different than everybody else, and he, and he looks different, he dresses different, he talks different, he acts different, but that's okay. There, there's something about that man that, that he loves God. He hungers and thirsts after righteousness. He, he desires it. Hey, today we have desires for everything in the world. Our imaginations are continually wicked. We're always looking at the next thing we can buy, the next thing we can give, the next thing we can look at, the next interest we can have, the next hobby we can have. Hey, maybe today is time we change our desires from the next thing we can have to the next time we can spend with God. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. God said, Noah walked with me. Noah had a desire for righteousness. Noah was willing to do whatever it took. I forget the words exactly of that song, but it kind of goes the way of Whatever it takes for my will to break, that's what I'll be willing to do. And I think that songwriter kind of figured out, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to save my family. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to stand in this evil day. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to have a relationship with God. I'm willing to do whatever it takes Hey, to raise up the next generation to walk with God. Whatever it takes. Say, what's the message here tonight? Noah lived in a wicked time just like we do. Noah was about to experience the judgment of God just like we are. And yet Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Because he walked with God. Because he walked with God. He wanted righteousness. He's willing to do whatever it took. I talked to a man and a wife not too long ago. They were having some issues with their teenage kids. They had two, a daughter and a son. Man, they were just going kind of crazy. They went to public school and and, uh, and I'm not against people that go to public school. I, I know some phenomenal public school people, or some young people that have gone. But that's where parents put them. That's where they're going to live. That's where they're going to go. Just got to walk with God and be strong. But there was, there was just some situations going on there. And, and they said, uh, how do I ask my kids? How do I ask my kids to do? And they named some certain things, this and that. And I just looked at him and I just said, well, I don't have teenagers yet. She might be barking up the wrong tree. You know, I try to be as honest as I can. Listen to me, I don't have all the answers. I have them all right there, but I can't always give you the answers. One time I called a man who uh, I respect very much. He's a friend of mine and there was a decision I needed to make in my life. And I said, hey, what do you think about this and this and this? And he goes, uh, let me pray about it and I might call you back. What kind of help was that? So I saw him about a month and a half later, a month later, something like that, and everything. And I said, what was that all about? He said, you didn't need my help. You got the same God I got. It's like there's nothing I could tell you you didn't know. You just got to be a big boy and make your own decisions. Talk to God about it. You know, that helped me. And it made me respect him more because he's not going to sit there and try to fine-tune my life. Really, he didn't know. He just knows the same God I know. So that's good. So I looked at them and I said, you know, I don't have all the answers. I don't have teenagers. I said, somewhere along the line, 
These kids got to want it for themselves. Somewhere along the line, it's got to become theirs. It's like this, and I'll be done here in just at least 30 minutes. It's like this. I've got my truck out there. It's got 230,000 miles, something like that, 30,000 miles on it. It's got a few dents and dings in it. But it's a pretty good old truck. It made it up here. Might not make it home, but made it here. You pulled out in the parking lot, or you got out in the parking lot, and you got the church bus, put the keys in it. You drove as fast as you could right down here at the end of the parking lot and just tagged my truck. You and me are going to have problems. <laughs> See, I got the title of that truck in my office at the house. It belongs to me. It's mine. And so now you're going to have to pay to fix what's mine because that's mine. But now if you turned around and did the same thing to Brother Haggett's truck, I might be a little aggravated, but it's not nearly as big a deal to me, you know? <laughs> Why? I didn't pay for that truck. I didn't service that truck last week like I did mine. I didn't pay for the tires that are on it. I don't have the title or the note or whatever it is some people have. It's not mine. So if somebody reared back and tagged his truck and totaled it, I'd be like, well, that stinks to be you, but I'm glad it wasn't mine. <laughs> and you know it's true, every one of you would say the same thing. But all of a sudden when it was mine, it was a big deal. And that's where many Christians are living today. Christianity is getting tore out of our country left and right. You're saying, well, it stinks for them. I'm sure glad that wasn't mine. Because it never belonged to you and I in the first place. It's time we own it like Noah did. It's time we own our relationship. It's time we step up to the plate and get back with walking with God. I think about one preacher who said, I pray for two hours every day. And somebody came to him and said, how do you pray for, how do you have time to pray for two hours a day? And he said, how do I not have time to pray for two hours a day? Johnny Pope, I love that man. He's a dear friend of mine. And the other day we were talking and, and he said, Luke, there's something special about somebody when you break that one hour mark. He said, you think about in the garden, he looked back at the disciples. He said, will you not watch and pray with me for one hour? He said, it seems like when you pray past that one hour mark, you break into a holy place where you meet with God. And yet I look in a room of people and I wonder how many of us have ever even prayed past an hour or half an hour or 15 minutes. I'm not preaching this in a condescending way at all. Please don't take it that way. But it's time for God's people to own Christianity again. It's time for God's people to own their walk with God again. It's time to put the title in your safe and own it. I don't know why God had me preach this message tonight because it's really not a message. It's just a Bible story. But I don't know, Maybe it's for the younger people. Maybe it's for the parents. Some of us need to be like Noah. Say, I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to hunger and thirst after righteousness. I'm going to do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to save my family. I said this morning, do you want God to work? Here's a good way. Walk with Him. I would challenge, let me just throw this out there. I'll do it with you. I'll do it with you. Why don't some of us just take one hour each morning of revival? One hour each day. Maybe you can't do it in the morning. Maybe it'll be in the day. Take one hour and just pray for one hour. One hour. Just see what God does. I don't know. I know this. Noah got the message. Noah walked with God. Noah saved his family. Noah owned it. He owned it.